virtual lecture series. All along, we have been dealing with categorical outcomes and how we can do summary statistics on them. Um, what we're going to do today is we're going to move into continuous variables. Yeah, we said Categorical outcomes have fixed positions. So, in natural fact, what we do when it comes to descriptive statistics, we actually do counts of frequency and percentages. But when it comes to continuous variables, for example, the ones we've come across, age, Weight, height, uh, as teacher Koku told you, they have infinite what positions. So, in order to deal with this particular type of data, we cannot say that we want to count the number of people who are 1.1, 1.2, 1.3. One point four to infinity. It means that it will not be easy to summarize such data by using what counts and then proportions or percentages for that matter. So when it comes to continuous variables, what happens is we try to summarize them by finding other ways. In this case, parametric ways to be able to what to try and then summarize them. But those parametric ways actually are meaningful for only parametric data. And then we try to do ranking of the data for non-parametric analysis for continuous variables. So when we come to continuous variable, because of the fact that not all will be able to be analyzed parametrically, we will have what we call the parametric and then what? The non-parametric data. Now, parametric data are data that are not skewed. That is, in this particular case, the data distance is not so much such that you can actually represent them with a midpoint, okay? A calculated midpoint, and that midpoint will make a meaning. So these are data that we say are normal. It doesn't mean the other data is what abnormal. Yeah, but what we say the data distribution is normal. That means that, for example, if you represent that data with, let's say, a mean, majority of the people will be closely gathered around the, what, the mean. So if it is, let's say, the age we are talking about, and then we have different, different ages, and then we are able to work out the average of the age, and then let's say we have a figure, like let's say 60. Now, for a data that is parametric, we expect that majority of the people will be having ages that are close to what, 80. 
that is either just above 80 or what below 80 or the same as 80. so such data majority of the people are gathering around the figure that you have used to what to represent them and that makes that particular data the figure you are using to represent them what meaningful in a case where you use a figure to represent a group on a certain attribute and the groups are such that they are overly guarded either above or below that particular figure then it makes that figure not representative of the what of that particular group so for example let's say that our 60 age that we are talking about we represent the age of the group with 60 years and we found out that majority of the people are 30 20 or let's say 31 35 and then we are saying that we are represent those people with what 60 years then that means that we will be misleading the what do you call it uh yes. with the information we are producing because somebody would think that those people in that particular group are very old people they are actually nearing their retirement or has what retired but in this particular case the people are rather what youthful so in this case that particular age does not really represent the what the group they are data like that that because of the distance and the scatter between the individual data it is not easy to represent them with what parametric analysis so such data we say they are what non-parametric data or they are what skewed now when a data is skewed that means that for example like we are talking about when they gather on a mean they might be all below the mean most of them will be below the mean at a distance or above the mean at what at a distance so if they are above the mean that means that the difference between them and the mean is what is positive because there will be some more of them if you take the mean out of them that is the difference will be positive so that means they will skew i get in the towards the right side that is they are positively skewed and if they are below the mean that means they becomes what negatively skewed right so based on these two things before you attempt to analyze descriptively any continuous variable the first thing you need to know is whether the data is what parametric or non-parametric So the first thing you need to know is whether the data you are dealing with is parametric or non what parametric in other words whether the data is skewed or not hello yes parametric data is it the same as those having the bell shape yeah so if you if you plot you plot, you plot the data, what happens is that majority of the data will be gathered around the mean. And then as you move away from the mean on both sides, they become smaller and smaller. So that is why you have the sigmoid or what the bell shapes. Now, they become smaller as in the concentration. The concentration of the people, yes. You have fewer people gathering away from the world from the mean that is the the mean actually represent majority of the world of the people the question now is how do i know that the data that i'm having is parametric or non-parametric now there are various ways that you can actually look at data and see whether they are parametric or non-parametric now but the question is that none of the statistical algorithms that have been developed that exist that can help you do that is foolproof okay now so we're going to go through various ways of screening data 
in order to find out whether they are parametric or non-parametric. Now, there are certain normality tests, okay, or parametric tests that are available that you can use to test and see whether the data is parametric or non-parametric. But this particular test, they themselves have inherent errors because those algorithms are mostly based on what we call standard error of the mean. And with the standard error of the mean, as the sample population increases, it is trying to state the bias or the deviation between the mean that you are getting from the sample from the population. So as the sample size increases, that means the sample size is becoming closer to the what to the population size. So the standard error of the mean becomes what small. So for data that you have so many sample size, the sample size is large. Okay, that means that the standard error becomes what very small. And so anything that you are using to compare the standard error, the likelihood that it won't pass is what is high. Because the medium of comparison has become what? Small. Hello? Mm -hmm. Yes. So we will go through some of those things and then you will see. So when the data set is large, what happens is that the likelihood that your data will not pass normality is high. Yeah. Which in some cases might not necessarily mean that the data is not normally distributed. What I'm saying is that most of the tests for normality are, are actually based on the standard error. But the, uh, what do you call it? The defect is that as the size of the sample becomes large, the standard error becomes what smaller. Because in that case, you are increasing the sample size which is making it get closer to the what, the population size. So the mean you are getting, the deviation between that mean and the actual mean in the population becomes what smaller. So that means the standard error becomes very small. And if the standard error becomes small, that is if you are comparing any deviation against that standard error, the likelihood that that deviation will be higher than the standard error is high. And in that case, that will make your, what do you call it, data not pass what normality. Now, so there are, we don't need to go to the algorithms. There are different types of algorithms that are available. At least you will see three of them. Uh, the Shapiro work, the uh, Smenov, uh, not the one that, you know, uh -huh, the Komogorov Smenov, and then the Diagasto. So, uh, you mentioned Yeah. How do you overcome that? Yeah, you overcome that by doing an overcoming test. So mm -hmm. I will show you the test that we use to overcome that. And the test that you use to overcome that is where you do what we call visual examination of the data. So you can graph the data and then check it yourself and see whether it is what it is correct. There are so many rules concerning normality testing. We will go through them and then we will see. Some are maybe too strict for certain particular analysis. Uh, so it depends on you, on how you will test your what, your normality. So at the end of the day, how you tested your normality should appear in your what, in your methodology writer. So that everybody will appreciate what you did. Okay, let's take this data. So if you come to this data, you realize that um, in this data, there are a lot of continuous variables that are available. You have age, you have weight, you have height, you have body mass index, you have weight circumference, hip circumference, waist to hip ratio, blood pressure, Diastolic blood pressure, that's systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure. So you can have them. There are so many. There are a lot of them. If you come to the main data as it is here, you can find a lot of others that are here. So you can have so many of them. So we're going to use this data 
actually to try and demonstrate a few of the things that we are talking about. This is actually laboratory data uh, that is coming from somebody's research work. So there is a HDL, that is high density lipoprotein, low density lipoprotein, triglyceride, total cholesterol, and all that. Those are the lipids. Mm -hmm. For our economics, for our economics and education and computer friends, when we say you are having cholesterol, 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 those are the things that we talk about. And for our mathematics uh, colleagues, uh -huh. yes. And then we have what we call C-reactive protein. They are what we call inflammation markers, uh, interleukin six, uh, two, uh, two uh, tumor nucleotide factor alpha and the rest so you have so many of them why, why don't you have forget the syria to put it their figures they are done it didn't run for everyone yeah so some of this data we're going to go through it a few of them and see what we mean by parametric and non-parametric cases right so let's just start with the initial terms that you may see when you start with, so use PRISM for this particular exercise. Later, we'll move on to another software. Right. So if you have PRISM, the only times you have used PRISM were when we we're doing contingency. So in this particular case, our interest is to do what we call column statistics because for the analysis that we are doing, we are interested in all the ones that are in the world in one column. Whether we add all of them and divide by what the total number, which we call what the mean or the average. So all of these fall under what we call what column stats. So you click on column statistics and then you click on what create. Now, why Prism is preferred by most people? The interface is just like Excel. So we could just copy anything here like this. Let's copy the age and then let's say the weight, the height, and let's say weight circumference. Copy it. You come into uh, Prism, you click here, and then you just paste it. And voila, it is there. Uh, the ones that have come that I didn't invite them. I can take them out. Okay. So I need only continuous variables here. So I have continuous variables like this one. So what I want to do now is I want to first try and see some normality information on this particular data that I have. So on Prism, with Prism, you go to what? Analyze. And when you come to analyze, don't forget, we say we are doing what? Column statistics. So the descriptives for these are all column stats. So we click on column statistics. And then when you are here, you choose on which of the analytes that you want to work on. So if you click on this one, you deselect everything. Okay? So you can now pick which one you want to work with. So for the first time, let's pick only age. You can work with all of them at once, but because we want to move at steps let's pick age so we pick age and then we click on what okay now when you click on okay this interface come to you now all the way from gss1 as you are coming you realize these are very familiar things like i keep telling you you know more than you think you do maximum and minimum you've heard that before right quartiles and when we say quartiles that means when we divide the data into what into four and then the quartiles the first quartile is what the figures below the 25th percentile and then from the 25th percentile to below the 50th percentile which is the same as what the median okay becomes the second quarter then from the median figure all the way to figure below the what the 75th percentile becomes the third quarter. And then 75th percentile up becomes what? The fourth quarter. 
as we come to do this analysis. Sometimes we'll be doing some of those things. Now, if you are not dividing them into four, that you have quarters, and you are dividing them into three, that becomes tatals. That is tatals. So with tatals, in that case, the 33.3, uh, what do you call the percentile will be the first one, and then 66.66 or 0.67 will be the what do you call it the, the second uh mark. So, the same way, if you are dividing it by three, the figure you get for the 33rd, uh, what do you call it 33.3 becomes the what below that becomes the first data, and then from the 31st, but below the what. The sixty-six point what six seven or point seven becomes the what the second turtle, and then the sixty-six seven and above becomes the what the third one. Mm -hmm. Now, if you are not dividing them by three, but you are dividing them by what five, then what you are doing is you are doing quintiles. You are doing quintiles. No, <laughs> if you are doing quintiles, what you do is that. In this case, you are sessioning the data into what? Into five. That is, when we say sessioning, that means you are ranking the data from the smaller to the highest and dividing them by what? By five. So in that case, the 20th what? Percentile becomes the what? The, the first point of the quintile. So below the 20th percentile, then from the 20th to the what? Below the 40th. Then from the 40th to below the 60th. And then from the 60th to below the what the 80th, and then 80 and above becomes what the upper limits for the for the quintile. Right. So you have all those options here. There are other options that we'll deal with them later. So when you want to do any percentile or something, you can click here and then put them inside. Any percentile that you click here and type it inside, it will give you the opposite. So for example, if you click on this one and you put 90. It will calculate the 90 and the 10th percentile for you. Hello? Yeah. So if let's say you are doing quintiles and then you put 20 here, it will calculate the 20 and the what? The 80th for you. Good. So all of these are familiar, as somebody will say. Then you come to this mean, which is the same as what? The average. Okay, you started doing averages long time ago. Then we have standard deviation and then the standard error of the mean, uh, which are actually measures of dispersion. We will deal with them. So the mean, the medians, uh, what those who want to confuse as the statistician will say that we are talking about what central tendencies. Yeah, they give big words just to confuse you. So when I talk of the mean and the median, then we are interested in central tendency. Then how the individual figures will deviate from the mean, okay, becomes the measures of what? Dispersion. How does the individual figures, how do they come close or away from the what? From the mean. So what we do, remember when we were in, doing in lower classes, when you subtract the mean from each of the individual what? Figures, okay? And because you will get some of them to be negative, what do you do? You multiply it by itself. And then after that, you divide it by each other. So it's more or less you are having the average deviation. So you remember, you subtract, and then what? Where the sigma to confuse you is just sum it. Okay? Uh -huh. So they are just the same thing that you have dealt with all this well. Hello. Right. So now we come to the important things that we need here. So the median is here. You can check the median if you want. So we are interested in this. They test if the values come from what? A Cassian distribution. That means if it comes from what? A normal distribution. Or in other words, if it is what? Parametric variable. So we will uncheck all the things at this top. We are not interested in them. We are not interested in the column sum. But we are interested in the skewness and ketosis. Skewness and ketosis. There are rules also that you can apply to use the skewness and the ketosis to be able 
to see whether data is what normally distributed or it is what is a skewed data. So in this case, you realize GraphPad provides what the Agasto, the Agastino, Pearson omnibus normality tests. We have the Shapiro work normality tests. We have Komogorov Smenev <laughs> tests with the Dalau Wilkinson's Lefilfo P <laughs> value. And they say even that one is not even recommended. <laughs> Dela. Dela. Right. All right. So let's choose all three and then work with our data and see what will happen. Hello. Right. So as soon as you choose whatever you want on this page, what you click is what? Okay. And when you do that, you have having uh, the summary that has been given to you. So this is what we are having. Now look at the three different normality tests that we've used. Now the first results that we are having here is from the what? The Agostino. Now that is the p-value is here. And then the question is this. Does this data pass the normality tests? Now, so if the data pass the normality tests, that means that the data should not deviate from what a normally what distributed data. That means the difference between the data and the what a normally distributed data should not be what significant. Are you getting me? In that case, it should be comparable to what a normally distributed what data. So if they are comparable, that means that the p-value 0.05 or what? Higher. So when the p-value is less than 0.05, that means that the data is actually different from what a normally distributed uh, data. Are you getting it? Good. So in this case, as you see the p-value to be 0 0.0002, it means it will not pass what normality because it's significantly different from what normally distributed data. That is according to what the the Agostino test. So it won't pass according to the Agostino. Then we come to Shapiro normality test for the same data, the same age data that we did. Again, for that one also, the p-value is what. It's significant. That is, it's smaller than what 0 0.05, which means that if you compare this to a normally distributed, uh, what you call it, data, it is what deviated. It is different, so it cannot be said to be normally distributed data. Then we come to the uh, what you call it, the Komogorov smenov The same thing, we did the same data, and this is the p-value. The p-value is what 0 0.0525 which means that it is not significantly different from the normal distributed data we are comparing. It's comparable. Mm -hmm. So if it is comparable, then we will assume that the data is normally what distributed. So you have the same data. You use one, what you call a normality test. It pass. You use other two normality tests, and it does not work. Pass. Hello. So this is why it's essential to declare. You declare what you used because the algorithms are slightly different and they will produce different what results. Hello? Hi. Good. Then let's move on. But the inherent problem among all of them is, is the same. Now, in actual fact, when we say a data is skewed. We can use the skewness of the data also. There are certain rules that you can use using only the skewness of the data in order to actually, uh, what do you call it, judge whether the data is normally distributed or not. One of them is that 
the data, the skewness of the data should not be greater than one. That is the data skewness, the skewness of the data. When you calculate the skewness of the particular data you are dealing with, it should not be what greater than one. So skewness less than what one is what acceptable. In this case, I'm not interested in the sign because the sign will show you whether the data is skewing to the what to the left or to the right. And I'm saying that when the data is skewing to the right. That means that most of the data is bigger than the what the average, the mean. When it's skewed to the left, it means that most of the data is what smaller than what the mean. Are you getting it? Yeah. So it's negatively skewed. That means skewing to the left. Positively skewed, skewing to the right. So I'm using the word one. I could say if you not be less, uh, what do you call it, greater than zero point, uh, negative or positive one, but the one is what I'm interested in. There are other rules that will go because GraphPad does not actually provide you the standard error of the of the skewness. So we cannot use that for the skewness in the ketosis. We will go to that rule when we go to uh, use another software that can be used. But all these rules are there. So you have to use one of them and then what tell us the readers what you use for your what your normality test. Hello. Good. Apart from this one, there are other rules to be observed that in a data population like we are having like this, for a normally distributed data. Um, when you do the mean and then you do its measure of dispersion, in this case, the standard deviation, that shows the variability of the data within the sample population that you have actually what calculated. Now, when you multiply that standard deviation by two, okay, and you add and subtract from the mean, that means that if you have the mean to be like, teacher who could date, if you have the mean as 20 and the standard deviation is what, four. That means you multiply that four by two, that gives you what, eight. So if you subtract the eight from the 20, that gives you what, 12. If you add it to the 20, it gives you what, 28. So that means that the 12 to the 28 will cover for 95% of the population for which the mean is what, represent hello yeah that's that is plus or minus two standard deviations will represent 95 percent of the population for which the mean is what represent so if you do those calculations and you do the standard deviation and you realize that the standard deviation two times the standard deviation is equal or greater than the mean Straight away, should tell you that that data is what skewed. It's non-parametric. So, for example, if it is age that we are dealing with, and then we find out that our mean age is 20, our standard deviation is, let's say, 11. What happens is that if you multiply that 11 by 2, you get what? 22. Now, if you subtract that 22 from the 2, you're going to get negative 2. That means that 95% of the data, some of them presented with what? Ages as low as what? Negative two. That should tell you that your data is not communicating what? Reality. So that is one of the rules that you can easily use to see whether data is parametric or non-parametric. Most often than not, you see people have actually worked on data, they've presented it, but some of these errors exist. Now, once it's a non-parametric data and you have presented it as parametric, it means that the mean that you are telling us, we cannot what? We cannot trust it because it doesn't represent the population for which uh, you, your sample population. And so, whatever you are communicating is baseless. But we see these things happen most often than that. Hello? Hi. 
uh, it is just because the basis, the basic knowledge, is not is not so basic to many of us. Yeah. <laughs> so you see, even high impact journals, and these errors are there. Once you present non-parametric data as parametric, means that you are miscommunicating. Whatever that you are actually putting out there does not represent what you got, the population for which you got. So we cannot rely on any of your results. So that is it. Then the question is that while we see parametric data, the summary statistics in this case is what? The mean. Okay? And then we add the deviations to it to show the measure of dispersion. But for non-parametric data, we may rank the data and then rather use what? The median. You remember the median? That's when you rank the data and come from top to bottom, the one in the what? In the middle. So for a non-parametric data, we use what? The median. The median, you can use the median the minimum and the maximum, the median, and then interquartile range. You just want to show how the data spread from the median. So any of those things that are available, you could actually what you use that. So you may want to say, show us the median, and then the minimum and the maximum. So you show us that, oh, okay, this is the middle data if we rank it, but this is the minimum that was found, and this was what the maximum. So you give us a range. Or you can choose to give us the interquartile range, that the cutoff point between the uh, first quartile and then what the third quartile. So all of these things, you remember, we did them manually. That's why I keep telling you, you know more than you think what you do. But before I end, let's just go back and then rerun for all the others. So we could have just click on this data set, go to what analyze. And then still is column statistics. This time around, we won't uncheck any of them. We will just click on what? Okay. Here, when we come here, we will deselect all of this. That's not our interest for now. We will only choose the skewness. And then we will also choose what? We will just come and choose the three tests just to observe. So if you do that, you realize that each of the uh, variables that you put in there. Yeah, this thing has been calculated. So this column is for the age. This is for the weight. This is for the height, the uh, height square, which you didn't need it. Then uh, this is what BMI and then weight circumference. So all of them has been calculated for you. So you can see for the age, we've gone through that already. Uh, if you take the weights, it didn't pass for the Diagasto. It did not pass for the Shapiro. And neither did they pass for the what? For the uh, uh, Smenot. Now, but if you look at the skewness, whether well, the skewness is what? Less than what? One. So if you are using the skewness rule, it may pass. Again, later on, I will session the data and then you realize that it's the date number of the data. This data set is about 200 and over. If I click on it like this, you see the counts. So that is getting to 200, that's 188, yeah. So because the data size is becoming large, that is why we are having difficulty in passing some of these things. So if you come to the height, you are having the same thing. It didn't pass for any of them. Yeah, because for most of them, yeah, it's an inherent algorithm. There is what standard error of the mean. So the standard error of the mean the, of the data becomes what smaller because the number is what increasing, and that is why but it has no pass. There is also this notion that the sample size. Yeah. No size is going to be so Yeah, that is what the theory should say. The bigger the sample so size. Yeah, but for all the testing this thing, so we'll go further and test this same data using other things and see that whether they can be accepted or they cannot be accepted as past normality. That is what is said, but in actual fact, 
in practice, there is inherent error in all the algorithms. So you cannot base on the algorithms and then decide on this. So, for example, Andy Fields will tell you that they can do, you can drink your Smenoff all right, but make sure that you observe the data whilst you are not bush with your eyes before you take your Smenoff. Right. Okay, so that is the results as we can see them. And then, so you can see that uh, the same scenario is happening here. It didn't pass for this one, but this time, right, it has passed for here. Again, it didn't pass for the two. This one, it has passed. Now look at this one. It didn't pass for this. It didn't pass for this. It didn't pass for this one. Now look at the third one. That is even interesting. You see the way circumference. It passed for the what? The Smenov. It passed for what? The Agasto. But it didn't pass for what? Shipper. Hello, are you getting it? Yes. So, because of the algorithm difference, and if you look at this data and you look at the skewness, which is far very low, 0 0.1, the likelihood is that this data are not skewed. Okay. All right. So among them, it is only this one that have skewness that is higher than what than one, a little higher than one. So we look at them later on when we come around. Okay. So on this note, we'll bring our lecture today into an end. We have started with continuous variable. And for anybody that deals with data, this is where the biggest of the analysis actually come. <laughs>